but uh, let's talk to how this could afford to affect the Supreme Court uh, if, if Judge Kavanaugh's decision goes through. But before that, uh, our, our friend, uh, criminal defense attorney Vikas Bajaj is here to lend his expertise. What's interesting about this, welcome Vic, nice to have you here. Good morning, thank you. Is that uh, unlike a courtroom where there's evidence, witnesses, and a process that's a legal process, this is a Senate hearing, a much more different, a much different setting where you have somebody accusing and somebody defending. Tell us about the difference between the two and what they mean. Absolutely, two different umbrellas by different names, but at the end of the day, very much the same sort of inquiry and calculus. In other words, in a criminal case, both in federal and state courts around the nation, we look at certain things such as the credibility of the witness, which is described by a number of factors, the ability to recall events as they occurred at the time, any recordations of that event, uh, any potential bias, uh, financial or personal or psychological or whatever it may be, and of course any corroboration over and above that. In the state of California we have that and we know our district attorney looks at those very closely before issuing cases, so we're sure about our charges. Unfortunately for someone in Judge Kavanaugh's position, we don't have a true referee. We don't have a judge saying, well, I object or I'm going to sustain that objection because that's outside the scope. But you will see the Judiciary Committee, uh, committee here talk about the exact same things. Did you have an ability to recall? Did you record in any way? Did you report to other people? And while it may be very easy in a knee-jerk way to say we are attacking the accuser, that is not the case. This is a fact-finding arena the same way we would have in court, but of course regulated by different rules of law. And and this is a little different in that they are, uh, the committee is bringing in a prosecutor from Phoenix, yes. Rachel Mitchell, to yes. do the questioning of both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. And they're saying a lot of this, we're assuming, is because of optics and that there is precedent for this. We saw that in Iran-Contra and Watergate. Yes. Yes. How do you think that is, is going to work? And, and was that a good idea? Is that how this probably should have happened? I think absolutely it should happen this way. And I don't believe it's a conclusion reached after a calculus of optics. I believe it's finding someone who is most qualified to conduct this type of questioning. Uh, the world of sexual abuse and sexual abuse prosecution and defense is a very unique world. It's, it's sort of a microcosm in the world of criminal and civil litigation. There are special rules that are attended to sexual abuse allegations. Prosecutors and seasoned de defense attorneys know these rules and they know, for instance, what to ask, how to determine and reach a conclusion as to whether there is significant corroboration for the allegations. So to answer your question directly, I do not believe it was a conclusion after conducting an equation to see what looked better uh, for either party or for the committee. I believe it was finding someone who is an individual that can also relate. She's a lady, mm -hmm. okay, and it's very, very caustic and sometimes aggressive for a male to ask questions that are so intimate of a female when it's really hard to get a grasp of what that person went through. And she is just very, very qualified in this specific arena. So, so not only a, a question of fairness, but also yes. a sensitivity because it is such a, a, a personal and traumatic experience for Absolutely. a lot of Absolutely. And I think, frankly, Dr. Ford is being done quite a justice and quite a favor here because we can see, even just by the introductory comments, how there are a bit of a polarized outlook on what we can expect and what the defenses and allegations will be. I think it's very important, probably the best decision on either side of the aisle to have a female seasoned prosecutor conduct this investigation. It is a very, very emotional thing to have gone through if this in fact is something that happened at the hands of Judge Kavanaugh. And I think having a female extremely prosecutor-oriented and experienced individual does justice for both sides of the aisle here. Dr. Blasey Ford is, is, is no slouch in her own in her own right. She right. Uh, has a master's degree uh, from, in clinical psychology from Pepperdine University that she received in 1991. Uh, in the 96, uh, she uh, received a PhD in educational psychology from USC. So she is a, a strong woman yes. uh, who's, who understands uh, psychology and uh, now she's being sworn in. So we're, let's, let's uh, Vic, we're going to 
going to take a moment uh, and we will go live to this now as she begins her testimony and Senator Grassley swearing her in. Let's watch. A 15 minute break is underway right now as you can see from the screen there down below. Uh, then testimony is expected to continue but we are here now again with Vic Bajaj uh, with, with your expertise in this. Obviously we, we heard a very emotional and uh, what seemed like a credible account from Dr. Ford. How, how is this going to move forward? Well, I don't think there were any surprises with that first line of questioning. It was what we would expect from a seasoned prosecutor. Handle it with gentle gloves. Elicit any issues that may be important. Here, I believe the issue is not one of total fabrication. You know, Dr. Ford, you made it all up. That's not a viable argument, and it doesn't fit the facts that we have here. What it is, though, is an inquiry into the ability to recall things correctly. Correctly. How many people were there? How did you arrive? And, and of course, why was this an issue that we are hearing about now versus since 2002 when you, when you talked about this before you were married, as she said in her introductory comments? So no surprises here. You can see some more perhaps theatrics by some of the senators that are going to get a chance here. But the issue is the ability to recall. As a defense litigator, if I put that hat on just for a brief moment, I would say that there is an enormous amount of fodder here as to why certain things were recalled, but other very important things were not. What I would not want is for the senators to harp on some statements and say, well, Dr. Ford, you're minimizing. For instance, I had one beer, but I was sure I left. I didn't know how, but I know I did not drive. So we would not want senators to harp on that and say, well, Dr. Ford, you're minimizing your potential contribution to this horrific incident. We don't want to see that. That would attack her unnecessarily. However, they are important facts to take into consideration when we look at a person's ability to recall events, which are now you know, 30 years old. One of the things that stuck out uh, to me this morning in, in the questioning uh, is that the, the Senate received information that perhaps two other men who claimed they were hit, the, her attackers, and not Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge, that these are the other two men who came forward. And then uh, Senator Dick Durbin asked her directly, uh, do you have, is there any reason for you, I mean, some, it, to, to a certain extent, do you have any question in your mind that it was Brett Kavanaugh who assaulted you? Right. And, and her answer was uh, unequivocally, it was Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, that's correct. And that's what we would see in these types of cases. There is, you know, a belief based upon reality. And there's also a belief based upon what we have etched in the stone before we have an opportunity to speak publicly. This is a story and a rendition that she recalls very clearly. No one is doubting that it happened. So this would not be the opportunity for her to say, well, I'm not 100% sure. The train has left the station. So she has to adopt that story fully. Just practically speaking, as human beings, that's how we react to statements that we adopt. Uh, but in this particular situation, I'm a bit concerned let's put it that way, I'm a bit concerned about why we have not heard of these serious allegations before. Now, let's not forget that Judge Kavanaugh was and is presently sitting on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. His confirmation after the nomination by President Bush was held up for three years. It was held up specifically regarding whether he was too conservative in his rulings. I remember reading a, st a stat about 98% of his rulings were conservative or right-leaning since 1998, some fact like that. Well, that is what the fight was about. And I understand Dr. Ford has held this situation very close to her. We've heard from her introductory statements that she told her husband about the situation before they were married in 2002. The confirmation process for Judge Kavanaugh from 2003, which was held up in two, until 2006, was very public and very politicized. And we heard and we read about that every day, not to the extent that we are hearing and reading about this confirmation process, but we heard about it. It was something in the mind's eye of our community. One would query why we would not hear this markedly important um, revelation of what happened during that confirmation process, which I said again is was held for three years. 
based specifically on his partisan rulings. So that would be something I would be concerned with if I were Madam Prosecutor asking the question. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that the person who's holding the hot potato really deserves to be holding the hot potato. I, I want to touch for a second on, on what uh, the, the heavy burden that the Senate Judiciary Committee has before them. Yes. As an individual, you know, take politics out of it, although I know it, it's very difficult in this kind of a situation. You have two individuals with impeccable records, highly educated, have had wonderful careers, both credible uh, in, their, in their stories. What, and, and you don't have evidence. This is something that there's no physical evidence to present. This isn't a criminal trial. This happened over 30 years ago. What do you do? I mean, it is literally a choice as to who you choose to believe, right? That's and th that, that's a that's a difficult burden. And and what a lot of the, the committee has said, or at least Democrats on the committee have said, is that it at least deserves the FBI's attention to to investigate and look into it. But that's a that's a it's a really I mean they're they're between a rock and a hard place to, to put it lightly. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why in the criminal arena and sometimes in the civil litigation arena we have statutes of limitations, right? That's why the judiciary globally in the United States says we cannot bring certain certain claims after a certain amount of time has passed because the accused or the defendant in those particular scenarios is significantly handicapped because the gathering of facts the gathering of witnesses to provide exculpatory evidence may have passed. People may have been in a situation now where they've passed away, they cannot be located, telephone records, writings, recipient witnesses may lapse and be forever gone. So this is why legislatures around our country and the federal uh, sentencing guidelines and our federal rules and regulations say, you know, there are statutes of limitations. There's a certain amount of time that you have to bring up this type of an allegation. You are absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day, does the FBI have any more of an ability to judge somebody's credibility than the three of us? I would say no, unless there is some corroborating evidence, some, some scientific evidence, phone calls, GPS trackers, locators, things that we did not have in the 1980s, unfortunately. And DNA this is, I think, the problem example. here. Yeah. Yeah. Vic Rajash, thanks very much. Appreciate your expertise. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with more Good Morning San Diego in just a moment. Thank you.